Welcome to Adastra. Which I think is a good way to start all these videos. I'm not going to say too much this time because I gave you the intro. As before we start the reading though, I'm just going to say with regards to this screen, I was right. <laughs> we'll find that out in a bit. But let's just pick it up uh, where we last left Amicus and Tibor, just arriving at Adastra. Welcome to Adastra, Tibor. I look out the window and see a large green and blue sphere shimmer below me. Beyond it there's another globe, this one chalky and grey. A smaller and even brighter orb floats further to the right, its colour almost pure white. Amicus points at the more Earth-like sphere. That specifically is at Astra. The planet to the left is Anchoris. There aren't many people there aside from miners. The smallest is Tork, a nether moon. I know you live on a planet, so Adastra might seem a bit small to you. I press a hand to the window and notice that it's ice cold. <laughs> Looks pretty big from here. Amicus leans over the console and starts touching at the screen. Re-entry sequence engaged. Go ahead and put your safety straps on. Re-entry is never comfortable in smaller ships. I hurriedly do as he says, sitting down and trying to figure out the seatbelt. Eventually Amicus has to come over and help, show me how the strap just feeds into a slot. This automatically pulls the straps tightly across my waist and chest. As Amicus gets in his own seat, we start to curve around to the darker side of Adastra. Every now and then there's a bit of a downward tug on my stomach. Sort of like when the passenger jet I was in was landing in Rome. I'd imagine that things would rattle around along with a bunch of fire and heat, like in a Hollywood movie. Instead, there's only a rumbling sound that accompanies a gentle vibration through the seat. There isn't any fire, but I do start to see blue flashes on the otherwise black windows. I look over at Amicus and see that he's got his eyes closed, looking relaxed. Um... The wolf opens his eyes and smiles gently at me. Oh, don't worry. This is all normal. I realise how nervous I must look, so I nod and lean my head back in the seat. The electric blue flashes stop after a while, then I feel one final downward pull on my body before the rumbling fades out. We sit in complete silence and darkness for a moment, for I hear Amicus moving next to me. OK, we're in the hangar right now. Just follow me into the palace. Amicus gets up, but the ship stays dark. So does the hangar. Okay, why aren't there any lights? Uh, everyone's probably asleep. I don't want to wake him up. I get the feeling that he just doesn't want anyone to catch us, but I don't say anything. I fiddle with my seatbelt, unable to get it undone, until I feel Amicus lean over me, breathing in my ears his large paw covers mine, pressing something that releases the strap. I stand up, feeling around blindly as I hold on to the seat, only barely able to make up the red bristles of the headrest in front of me. I reach out a hand. Hey. Amicus's rough paw pads envelop my hand. What's wrong? I can't see anything. Oh, can you not see in low light? Amicus starts pulling me along before I hear a soft beep, then a whooshing sound. Oh, not really. Another sound catches my attention. Crickets. They have crickets here too? At the same time I'm hit by a wall of humid warmth, almost like walking into a sauna. Amicus puts a paw against my chest. Wait a second. Then I hear a soft thud followed by a grunt. Hello? Lean down. My eyes have adjusted a bit more to the dark, and barely able to make out what I think are paws reaching up toward me. I crouch down and Amicus grabs me into the arms before pulling me clumsily off the deck of the ship. My face mashes up against his furry chest for I'm set down on my feet. Alright, so we're just going to go straight to my room. I'll try not to make too much noise. I start to nod but Amicus is already pulling me along. The humidity presses down on me like a physical force. I start to worry that I might actually have trouble surviving on this moon. It's really hot. Well, things will cool off once we're inside. I can hear him panting heavily as we move through the hangar. 
I still can't see much, just angular shapes in the darkness, but finally I see some light ahead with some cold air. We turn a core and I have to blink against how bright it suddenly becomes. I look around at the pillars and marble floor, the bright lights above me and what looks like a garden complete with statues extending out to the archways. Well, at least I know Amicus wasn't lying about living in a palace. What do you think? Wow, I mean, it looks really cool, really expensive. I don't know if that last part was such a great compliment, but Amicus seems happy. Thanks. Well, it's going to be a home for a while, so I'm glad you like it. Amicus adjusts his cape, fanning it out a little. Well, this is only a small portion of the palace, of course. Well, I'll show you around later, but for now I want to go to my room and dry out a little. Well, I must look a mess right now. Oh, the humidity isn't doing my fur any favours. I can tell Amicus is genuinely embarrassed, even if he's trying to joke, so I put a hand up to my hair. Well, I have a little less to worry about, but I'm sure my hair is pretty crazy right now. Well, true, that patch of fur really is something, though. The wolf reaches out and touches my hair, run between the pads on his fingers. We've made physical contact several times over the last day. This is the first time that it really feels friendly. We stand there for a moment, just long enough for things to get awkward. Amicus pulls his hand back suddenly, as if realising what he's doing. Oh, uh... He's saved from having to think of something to say as we both hear footsteps coming up the hall to our right. Shit! What? Hide and be quiet. Amicus whispers loudly at me and suddenly pushes me hard back the way we came. I stumble before scrambling around the corner. The footsteps get louder as I stand up and press my back against the wall, listening. Amicus? I jump, the person almost shouting Amicus's name. Cassius? Amicus, Amicus's deeper voice responds, sounding cool and collected. Where the hell have you been? His voice is higher pitched and a little more articulate than Amicus's. I start to look around the corner, then hesitate. Then I do it anyway, wanting to see who this person is. Luckily Amicus has moved further down the room, so I'm slightly behind this Cassius guy. I see a white wolf, quite a bit smaller compared to Amicus, but no less intimidating. Maybe even more so. I can tell by his demeanour that he's probably not a fun person to be around. Well, I was out hunting. Is something wrong? Hunting? For two days? Is that a joke? Was it that long? Yes, you were supposed to make a speech in Lux yesterday. How many times did we remind you of it? Cassius suddenly takes a deep breath. Really, Amicus, you seem to expect everyone to cover up your mistakes. I can't comprehend how you could have forgotten. I uh, lost track of time. That's not an excuse. How do you expect to become emperor if you act this way? Amicus growls. Don't even pretend, Cass. You're probably happy I missed it. That's ridiculous. Amicus, I only want what's best for the Empire. Amicus opens his mouth and shuts it suddenly. No, I'm not doing this tonight. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. Cassius quietly regards Amicus for a moment, then shakes his head. Well, Virginia went in your stead, so you have her to thank when she returns. Well, she's better at that sort of thing anyway. The point was to show Lux that the next possible Emperor stands in solidarity with them. Sending your sister is not a good look. Well, walking around in undergarments doesn't look good either. You think that's how an Emperor should behave? No one's awake, Amicus. Don't be such a pup. Oh, I'm just saying you look really small without your armour. Now that is not a good look for an Emperor. Excuse me? What? I only want what's best for the Empire, and a little runt like you definitely isn't. They stare at each other for a long time. Though I have no idea what's going on, I can almost see the electricity arc in between them. Finally, Cassius turns on his heel and stalks away, tail swishing furiously. Good night, Amicus. Amicus stands there for a moment, still puffed out a little before he finally deflates. 
damn it. I stand quietly around the corner, waiting for Amicus to call me back. When he doesn't, I whisper at him. Amicus? His ears prick up and he turns to me. Hey, come on. We should go before anyone else decides to show up. Okay. I can tell by the way the wolf walks, his ears slightly down, his tail almost dragging, and he's not in a good mood. You all right? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Well, my brother just knows how to irritate me. Well, I shouldn't have said that to him. We quietly walk through the marble halls, the echoing of our footsteps the only sound. Is he not supposed to see me? Well, I just need to think of the right way to introduce you. Now isn't the best time. Is he the one that challenged you for the throne? Amicus is quiet for a moment before heaving a huge sigh. Yes, and he's really starting to turn my life upside down because of it. Sometimes I think he just sees this all as a game. We come to a stop at what looks like a door. It's completely smooth though, made of what also looks like marble. Amicus doesn't make any move to open it. And you know, he never seemed concerned for me and my duties until after he made his challenge. And that's what bothers me the most, knowing that it's all an act. I guess you're not really close with him then. Well, not since we're pups, no. A disturbing thought suddenly hits me. Well, you know in Earth's ancient Rome, the place where you guys have lifted, people would kill each other over the throne, like, like a lot. So that happened here? Amicus frowns. Uh, I suppose it's happened in the past, but that was a long time ago. Besides, Cassius would never do something like that. Amicus sticks out his paw and presses it to a black square on the wall. The door slides open without a sound. I feel a rush of cool air come out of the room, and Amicus lets out a happy sigh as he steps inside. Uh, that's much better. My dad's advisor keeps the climate way too hot in the rest of the palace. I follow the wolf inside and look around. Aside from a few quirks, the room looks like it could have come straight of any luxury hotel on earth. Amicus sits heavily on the bed, making it squeak. He starts to strip off his clothing. The toilet and bath are in there. He nods ahead at another door across from the bed. Then he jabs a thumb back at the large curtain. Well, it's the balcony if you want to get some air, though I don't know why you would in this weather. Then he points at the couch. Well, and that can be where you sleep, if that's all right with you. I've known other aliens to prefer the floor, though. Well, the couch is fine. I walk over the red sofa, sizing it up. It's more than big enough, but as I pick up the little black pillow, I notice it's covered in fur. I inconspicuously pick some of it off before a light blanket smacks into the back of my head. <laughs> there you go. Is that all okay? Yeah, this is good. I hope the blanket will be enough to keep off the cold that seems to be wafting down from the ceiling. Good. Well, like I said earlier, I'll show the rest of the palace tomorrow. We'll get some real food too. Amicus sprawls back on the bed, not bothering to draw up any blankets, his eyes closed. I actually want real food now, but I don't say anything and instead lay down. The sofa a bit harder than I'd expected. Good support, I guess. As I'm settling in, I think Amicus has already fallen asleep. That's when he speaks again. And thanks, Tibor. I don't know what he's thanking me for. For not killing him on the ship? For agreeing to help him become Emperor? For the way I took the shitty silver and flimsy blanket without complaint? But I'm not sure, so all I say is... Sure. Then I hear the wolf snoring softly, and the lights suddenly dim and down until they're off. I lay there a while, though I'm not sure for how long. In fact, time seems to have lost all meaning since I was abducted. Amicus's brother said it had been two days, but didn't Amicus say that time freezes when travelling in the stretch drive? Had we really spent that much time idling around? I need to stop thinking about everything that doesn't make sense, because that's basically everything. I just need to help this wolf so I can get the hell back home. Then I can pick apart everything I've been through all I want. For now I just need to help things move along as smoothly as possible. 
With that thought in my head, and with the soft sounds of Amicus's gentle snoring, I am lulled into a light and troubled sleep. The dream I have is strange. I am in a black void of some kind, and despite the emptiness I have some sort of purpose. I don't know what that is, but I am being driven towards it. It's not a good dream, it's a borderline nightmare. The empty void isn't the scary part though. It's the feeling that I'm being watched by someone, or something. It's the feeling that I have no say in where I'm going. No choice at all. I'm very curious about you. What? I'm limited in what I can ask, but I'll start with this. What is death to you? I see. Sometime just before I fully wake up, I hear something moving around behind me, followed by a mumbled voice, then the soft padding sound that fades out after a few moments. I wonder if one of my flatmates just arrived and looked into my room for some reason. As I shift around, I frown at how weirdly firm the bed I'm laying on is. The bed was softer than this when I got into it. Where are the sheets? I open my eyes and see a red velvety service in front of me. Then I turn over and see an unfamiliar ceiling with a gold square pattern above me. Oh yeah. I look over toward the bed where I expect to see Amicus, but it's empty. I stare again at the ceiling for a while, letting the sudden realisation I'm still here wash over me. I go over everything that happened yesterday, the last shred of hope that I've been dreaming fading from my mind. I look over at Amicus's bed again. Wondering if he'd gone into the bathroom. I listen for a while, but I don't hear anything coming from the door across from the bed. There's a muffled sound what I assume a bird's chirping come from behind the curtain. Slowly I slide off the sofa, feeling the cold marble against my bare feet as I do. I shiver and decide to bring the blanket with me, wrapping it around my shoulders. I shuffle around the sofa and move the side of the large curtain to pull it back just slightly. The air that comes through is fresh and immediately reminds me of camping by a lake during summer camp. That would make sense because ahead of me is what looks like a massive body of water that seems to come right up to the edge of the balcony. It's warm but not nearly as humid as it was last night. Pink and orange light paints the clouds on the horizon and for a moment I take in the sight. The hills and mountains to either side of the lake are covered in lush green trees. So is the little island that weighs out to my left. In the distance, on the other side of the lake, is what looks like a city of some kind. It's hard to tell how big it is since it's a good ways away, but from what I can tell the buildings are massive, and the smaller structures that taper off the side seem to stretch far off behind them. Dim lights from windows glitter in the distance, and I wonder if that city is full of wolves like Amicus and Cassius. Despite my situation, I kind of want to go see it. As I watch, I see a small, dark oval shape descend down toward the city, blinking blue and red lights. I have to smile and shake my head a little. I still want to go back to Earth, but this is undeniably amazing. I let the curtain slide shut finally and turn back to the room. So where did that big wolf go to? He could have at least told me before he ran off. Good morning, Tibor. I jump as the computer voice crackles overhead. I clutch my chest, breathing hard as the voice continues. Amicus has a message for you. There's a pause then. Hey, Tibor, I'm going to my morning meditation. It's in a room just down the hall. I'll be back in 15 minutes. Well, why don't you take the time to get familiar with the room? There's a pause then. Are you still recording, Com? Yes. To end recording, say, end of message. Oh, um, uh, see you soon, Tibor. End message. Is it still? To end recording, say end of message. My God, end of message. I hear Amicus starting to curse again before the message cuts out. I look around the room a bit, noticing how little there is to get familiar with. 
Well, I could look through the dresser, but I assume that's mostly filled with Amicus's things. I doubt he wants me to get familiar with those. <clears throat> I move across the room toward the bathroom door, stand in front of it for a moment before studying the black panel in the middle of it. It's similar to what Amicus used to open the door in the hallway. I reach out to try and push it, and the moment my fingers brush against the surface, the door slides to the side so fast that I jump. The lights inside come on, slowly illuminating the interior. I poke my head inside, then quickly step in, imagine the sliding door suddenly closing and chopping my head off. It stays open until I'm halfway in the room, then it closes automatically. There's a large sink to my left and an even larger mirror above it. In the corner there's a marble looking bench with a hole that I can only assume is a toilet. Finally, across from that is a large bath and what I imagine to be the shower. I actually really need to pee, so I head over the bench and do my business down the hole, hoping it's not something like a laundry chute and I'm pissing on the servants below. As soon as I start, though, water begins to pour down the sides of the tube, leaving me pretty sure that it is indeed a toilet. I guess I should be more confident in assuming things about this place. Everything is fairly similar to what I had on Earth. I walk over to the sink and push in the faucet, and I stick my hand under it. Water starts pouring out. I'm tempted to take a drink, but then I notice the water is bubbly and soapy looking. Having nothing left to do in the bathroom, I turn back to the door and find the black square again. I reach for it, and just like before, the door slides open. If he thinks he's going to get away with it... Cassius is facing away from me, his arms folded as his bushy white tail swishes from side to side. I freeze up, staring at him wide-eyed. I have plenty of time to jump to the side, maybe hide in the shower area. I just stand there like an idiot as the wolf turns around, almost in slow motion. He freezes just like I did when he spots me standing in the doorway. We stare at each other for a moment. For a very long moment. Then he screeches, making me jump back in shock. Oh God, Edipal, what is it? The wolf dodges back and forth as expecting me to try and run at him. Kato, Kato, help, come quick. Finally, Cassius' little dance of terror ends with him sprinting to my left and out of the room. I stand there for a moment listening to his screams fade down the echoing hallway or wondering if I should hide or something. Maybe go back into the bathroom and try and lock it. Instead, I hear more thudding, someone running up the hallway from the other end. Then Amicus comes running into the room, sliding to a stop in the middle of it. He spins in a circle, then spots me and runs up to me. What happened? Uh, Cassius came in and saw me. You let him see you? What? No, he just came in. Where were you? Meditating. I left a message. Where did he go? Cassius, he just ran off. Damn it! Amicus stands there, his tail thrashing back and forth. I glare at him. If you hadn't just left me here, this wouldn't have happened. Cassia shouldn't have come, even come in here. Amicus turns away and starts pacing back and forth. What are you doing? Shh, I'm thinking. I bristle a little at being shushed, but I stay quiet, watching the wolf stalk back and forth. I hear voices again. Cassius is along with another deeper voice. Amicus turns to me. Just be quiet for a moment as I try to explain things. Understand? I glare at Amicus. His ears flatten, his expression becomes a bit more desperate. Please? I still don't say anything, but I give him a curt nod. Amicus reaches out towards my shoulder, then pauses and instead offers his paw to me. I take it and he gently pulls me from the bathroom to stand next to him in the middle of the room, facing the open doorway to the hall. Amicus fixes a confident smile on his face, but can feel how tense he is next to me. From around the corner comes Cassius, but he's hiding behind someone else, another wolf. They both stop in the doorways, a larger wolf takes in both Amicus and I. Amicus, what are you doing with it? Step away! Amicus gently places his paw around my shoulders, draw me against his bulk. Cassius's eyes widen at that, though the wolf next to him seems to have no reaction. Then again, that could just be because I can't see his eyes. What are you doing, Amicus? Amicus clears his throat. Cassius, Cato. He nods to each of them in turn. This is my pet, 
Tibor. Cassius's mouth falls open. The other wolf, Cato, seems to shift a bit at that. Silence drags out. Then Cato shifts again. Is this where you were the past two days, Amicus? Amicus's arm tightens a bit around my shoulders, draw me in closer. Yes. And that's where you took your father's ship? A slight pause. Uh, yes. Cassius gasps. He can't do that! He glances at Cato. Can he? The bigger wolf is quiet, and even though I can't see his eyes, I get the feeling that he's watching me closely. Cassius, Cassius turns his glare back on Amicus. Where did it come from? Amicus rubs my arm. He came from far away. Is he a child? Yes. What? He can't, he can't just take someone else's child? Can he? Again, Cassius looks at Cato. And once again, Cato is quiet, then he finally sighs. We'll discuss this over breakfast, Amicus. Get dressed and bring the creature with you. Well, as long as he's safe. Well, of course. Then we'll continue the conversation there. With that, Cato turns on his heel and walks out of the room, leaving Cassius to look after him with a gaping mouth. He turns back on his snarling. I don't know what you're planning with that thing, Amicus, but if I know you, it's going to be incredibly stupid. He takes another second to look at me with unmistakable disgust. You could have at least obtained one that isn't quite so ugly, you know. Leave, Cassius, and don't think about snooping around in my room again, understood? Cassius doesn't respond and simply walks away, looking over his shoulder just before he leaves. And expect to receive punishment from Cato from stealing Father's ship. Absolutely outrageous! I watch Cassius's tail swish out of sight behind the doorway. Amicus lets out a huge sigh and I feel his chest deflate against my shoulder. Damn it! I sigh as well. You really didn't think all of this through, did you? I slowly move out from under the wolf's heavy arm. Well, like I said, I made many mistakes. I'm just tired of lying now. You still told them I'm a child. Amicus brings a paw abruptly up to his mouth, touching the pads of his fingers to his lips. It might not be a shushing gesture I'm familiar with, but I know what it means. Amicus listens, his ears straight up and eyes looking up at the ceiling. Finally looks back at me, whispering. That is something I can never tell them the truth about. It would be best if you never mention it again. Please. His suddenly serious demeanour cools my mood at all, so I just sigh again and sit on the edge of his bed. Amicus stands there awkwardly for a moment and quickly moves over the open door, placing a paw to the square to close it. He moves back over to me, his voice still lowered. Well, if we're going to pass you off as a pet, then I should probably get you familiar with your duties. My duties? I raise an eyebrow at Amicus. Amicus sighs. Well, I understand your frustration, but we need to do this right if we want things to go as smoothly as possible. You don't have to do anything, but it will help you blend in better. I roll my eyes and lean back on my hands, looking up at Amicus. All right, uh, what do I do? Well, first of all, I take my shower and... You help me wash. Help you wash? Uh, yes, you would soap my fur and such. We stare at each other for a moment. Um, it's something that the others wouldn't see, so I suppose it's not necessary. Oh, unless you want to. No. Well, all right then. Uh, never mind on that one. Amicus is clearly offended. Dude, I'm not going to soap up your naked body. Yeah, you made that clear. Anyway, I'd honestly rather skip the show today, but spending all that time in the spaceship just left me rather unkempt. Amicus turns to the bathroom and opens the door. He should at least come into the bathroom while I shower in case Cassius decides to barge in again. You can stare at the wall or something. Amicus stalks into the bathroom and I have to smile as I follow in, the door closing quietly behind me. Amicus notices me smirking. What? I shrug. Oh, nothing. Just kind of funny that you got so huffy. Well, I don't know what that means. Amicus is adjusting his underwear, then it suddenly drops and I quickly look away. Huh, I suppose your people prefer modesty? 
Out of the corner of my eye, I can tell that Amicus has on a smirk of his own. Around others, at least, and you guys don't just walk around naked, so don't you prefer modesty too? It all depends on the time and place. Amicus moves into the shower for the next ten minutes. I sit on the counter while the room fills with steam. Once the water shuts off, a loud fan starts up and I glance over and see Amicus with his arms out, his fur blowing back and forth. He notices me look over, then look away again. You know, you almost have to shout over the fan. You could have cleaned up too if you'd shower with me, but you won't have time with breakfast coming up. You'll have to do it after. I shrug and wait as Amicus steps out and grabs clean undergarments hanging from a hook, which he spends the next minute tying on. All right, balls are gone. You can look now. Actually, do you even have those? I don't want to assume. I open the door and head back out. Guess you'll never know. <laughs> Amicus spends another minute in the bathroom, opening the door into the sink and rifling around in it. Well, the next thing you're supposed to do is get the brush and oils from here. He lifts up a brush and a few glass bottles with colourful liquids inside before coming over to stand in front of me. He sighs. I know you don't want to, and I realise now that I'm repulsive to you. I can't really reach every part of my coat, and it'd be strange if I called for a drone when I have a pet. I think about making another moody remark, but the expression on his face makes me pause. I suppose I am being a little bit bratty right now. Besides, what else am I going to do while I'm here? Sit on the sofa all day? I get up and take the brush from Amicus and I see a surprised smile on his face. Thank you, Tibor. He shows me how to apply one of the liquids, a honey-coloured one, to the brush. Well, it's a treatment for my fur. Keeps it soft and voluminous looking. Here, you just take the brush and run it with the lay of my fur. He hands the brush to me and then stands facing away. I start slowly and run the brush through the fur between his ears and down his broad back, watching the slightly dishevelled hairs line up and lay down smoothly. It accentuates his shoulder blades and the thick and smooth muscles in his back. I'm hesitant at first, but I become more confident with each stroke. Actually, it's kind of relaxing. That is, until I brush down the left side of his neck, which makes him gasp. I pull back quickly. Sorry, did I brush too hard? Amicus chuckles. <laughs> uh, no, that's just where you hit me earlier. Oh. I look closer and see that there's what looks like a lump under the fur. I carefully brush around it and move to Amicus's front. Amicus, meanwhile, has his eyes closed with a smile on his face, clearly enjoying himself. I am sorry about that, by the way. I was really scared when I did it. Oh, don't worry about it. I deserved it for tidying you up so poorly. Amicus gives me a wink. I feel my face grow a little hot as I focus on getting the fur to lay just right on his biceps. And you know, you're not repulsive to me at all. I've just been a dick earlier. You look good. Well, I suppose I was too. I shouldn't have made fun of your sensibilities. All aliens have their own cultures which are different, but that doesn't mean less valuable. Amicus's tone sounds weirdly rehearsed, like he's quoting something. And also thank you, Tibor. I think you look good too. You might just be returning the compliment, but it's nice to hear after what Cassie has said. I definitely wasn't lying, and now that I'm this close to him, I have to admit that he is a little handsome. His face is expressive and kind of charming, and there's just a generally friendly air about him. And, well, then there's his body. It's thick and masculine, just like a burly human, and really can't deny it's kind of appealing. Kind of. I start to brush down the wolf's front, feeling his chest and stomach rise against the brush with his breathing. I sculpt the light fur around his pecs to accentuate them better, since it seems that's how he was keeping it earlier. I can't blame him. Then I move to his belly, moving the brush over its thick and slightly rounded form. The muscles are less defined here, but I can still sense the strength underneath it all. As I brush the lower part of his midsection, I notice the crotch of his loincloth bulging out rather far. All, all right, uh, thank you, Tibor, that should be good. He takes the brush from my hands and turns away, leaving me with a strong suspicion that he's adjusting himself, though he covers it up by pretending to mess with the other bottle. Finally, he turns around, looking flushed. Uh, hold out your paws, please. 
I stick out my hands and he tips the bottle over, the liquid in this one having a purplish tint to it. Several drops fall into my hand. Immediately my nose is filled with that lavender scent that I've been smelling off Amicus since I first met him. I rub them together then just to pat up my body and underarms, along my neck as well. I can tell Amicus is still flustered so I do it quickly, not wanting to linger and cause the wolf any other... problems. Maybe it just feels really good to be brushed like that? Is this like perfume? Yes, it keeps the musky scents hidden for the most part. I see. Do you use perfume? Well, I guess I do wear something like that on my underarms. Oh, feel free to use it then. I decide not to tell him that lavender scents are mostly for women on Earth. Besides, it does smell nice. Once the perfume is done, Amicus moves on to getting dressed, showing me how to drape his cape over his shoulders. Alright, so I know you only have the pair of clothes you came with, so I'll have a tailored drone come up later today, see if we can't make you more pairs of what you have. Oh, okay. Now, let's head to the dining room before we're late. Amicus pauses, frowning. Now, I know you won't like it, but you're going to have to feign some ignorance in front of the others. I raise an eyebrow. How so? Well, you're going to need to act a bit dumb. The antagonistic feelings that have been fading over the past few minutes start to rise up again. And how do I do that? Amica shrugs. Oh, I don't know, give them vacant stares, incoherent mumbles. Act like you can't grasp more complex matters. The whole point is to make it seem like you're a typical child. I don't like it, but I don't want to have anything to do with those aliens, so if you'll make them leave me alone... All right. Amicus lets out a breath, clearly relieved. Thank you, Tibor. This may not always have to be the case, but for now we need to play on the safe side of things. Just let me do all of the talking. You got it. Great. Now right, let's hurry to the dining room. I don't want to make Kato any more angry than he already is. And with that, I follow Amicus out into the hallway. So, who's Kato? The well, wolf you saw with my brother. He was my father's advisor and currently acting emperor. I mentioned earlier they'll be choosing between me and my brother. That's why I'm doing my best to keep him in a good mood. Or at least not in a bad mood. I don't think he has a good one. I keep in mind Stan Cato's good side as well. Meanwhile, sunlight pours in through the open windows and I can hear birds calling from outside again. Birds? What was that? I can hear birds. I'm just surprised they sound the same as they do on Earth. Ah, uh, yes, well, you wouldn't know this. All well, life has the same origin and it develops in a roughly similar way. Well, it's only natural that life here is similar to your moon, uh, planet, I mean. Oh. Well, all life on this side of the universe, at least. There may be another, but we'll have to leave that conversation for later. For now. I follow Amicus around the corner and find myself standing in the large, spacious room. The first things I notice are the large screens on each wall of the room, displaying colourful images of stars, galaxies and spaceships. In the middle of the room are what look like beds surrounding a table. In those beds are the two wolves I saw earlier. Cato is sitting and leaning over towards Cassius, who is draped luxuriously over one of the beds. Cato is talking to Cassius while the other wolf has on his typical sour expression. Sitting on the floor in front of Cassius's bed is a creature I've never seen before. It's definitely not a wolf, more feline-like. Cassius has his paw on its head, idly scratching it while he listens to whatever Cato is saying. He sees us and abruptly stops, sitting up. Cato stops talking and looks over at us. You're late. Well, good morning to you, Cass. And to you, Cato, Alexios. Amicus turns to Cato and the small cat creature, bowing to both of them. Oh, good morning. Morning, Amicus. The cat, Alexios, nods at Amicus with a smile. At the same time, I see Cassius tuck on the gold collar around his neck. It isn't very much, but Alexios immediately drops a smile from his face, looking down. How many times do I have to tell you not to acknowledge him, Amicus? Amica seems to ignore Cassius, walk into the empty bed while pulling me along with him. He whispers in my ear, Sit in front like Alex is doing. I look over at the cat and see his ears perk up, perk up in our direction, but he continues to avoid looking at us. 
Isn't it an alien position, so I do the same, starting to feel a little uneasy about this whole setup. Amicus, meanwhile, stretches out across the bed, an elbow in the cushions as he props himself up. Come, send in breakfast. Yes, Cato. A few seconds later, literal flying saucers levitate into the room from beyond another archway. Again, a moment sees some sort of black device on the underside of the plates before they gently come to rest on the table. I blink, but don't say anything, deciding just to take everything in without question. I decide instead to focus on the food. I can at least identify a few of the portions, one of them being what looks like bread. Then there's a plate of an old white crumbly substance, and next to that is a bowl of what I'm pretty sure are olives. There's a glass bottle filled with some type of red liquid, probably wine. Finally in the middle, next to some towel-like napkins, is roasted poultry, golden coloured and steaming. It actually smells really, really good, and considering I haven't eaten any real food in over a day, I feel my mouth water. Still, I have enough common sense to know that I probably can't just dig in, so I keep an eye on the cat waiting to see what he does next. He grabs four small plates from the tall stack and sets them down in front of himself. Then he starts to grab some slices of bread which he sets down on one of the plates. I look back at Amicus and he nods. So I do the same, grabbing four plates and setting them out in front of myself on the table, starting to grab the separate portions of food step set them on their own plate. Meanwhile, Cato just leans over to grab his own while Cassius cleaves his throat. So, Amicus, what is this? I look up and immediately find Cassius's eyes bore into mine. I quickly look back down and grab up the wood-handled knife that Alexios set, just set down, using it to spread the white stuff onto the slices of bread. I wrinkle my nose at how stinky it is, and I realise it's probably some type of cheese. This is Tibor. He's my pet. No, Amicus. What is it? It's not one of our children. Does it belong to a sibling? I'm half listening to the conversation when I see Alexios reach out with his bare paws and just pull a chunk of meat off the poultry. I hesitate, kind of wishing I'd had a chance to wash my hands, but do it anyway, wincing at how hot it is. The temptation is strong just to stuff it in my mouth, but I manage to set it down on the plate. Finally, I grab up a bunch of olives and put them on their own plate. At this point, I can see that Alexios is lining his plates up in front of Cassius on the bed. Carefully, I do the same for Amicus, though I lose an olive in the process. I watch it roll across the ground, but decide to ignore it. And Amica just pats my head with a muttered, oh, Thank you. Uh, no, he's from a failed uplift. I watch as Alexios starts filling the goblet with the red liquid, look up when I realise there's complete silence. Cassius and Cato are both staring at Amicus. I look back at him and see that he looks pretty calm, though I can see him picking at his claws. Are you serious? Yes. What? What? Why? He's a barbarian. Because I've decided the abandoned children deserve to re-establish regular contact. Or well, if we unite with the Chemians, then we also need to unite ourselves. I start filling Amicus's goblet as I feel his eyes on me. Child or not, having a pet like this will show the Chemians my intentions. Cassius scoffs loudly, popping an olive into his mouth and chewing it vigorously. Masterful stunt, Amicus, but you still saw father's ship to get there. Using stretch tech without authorization from the Emperor is a violation of the law, is it not, Cato? I hand the goblet to Amicus, silently wondering if the wolf is going to be thrown in jail my first day here. What would happen to me then? Still, Amicus looks calm, and when he sees my wide eyes, he just winks. Well, there could be, but there's no Emperor, is there, Cassius? Cato finally lays back, his small plates heaped high with food. He turns his head back to Amicus. Are you saying you piloted the ship to the outer reaches of our empire? Well, voice commands only work for the Emperor, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. I learned to navigate the ship on my own. I was also able to communicate with their people, negotiate and sign their contract with him. This is where I start to hear Amicus's voice falter. I actually do believe now that he doesn't lie often, because it's so clear he's bad at it. I copy Alexios and return to my kneeling position next to the bed, then switch across cross legged one when my knees get too sore. Cato watches from his bed silently, and I again feel unnerved at the feeling that he might be looking at me. 
Fascinating. Cassius curls his lips back. Fascinating. He used the stretch drive. He's going to get away with it because father is dead. What does that make of all the other laws? Can a beggar now steal from the market because there's no authority to tell him not to? Can a child rebel from the empire because there's no emperor to tell them? Quiet, Cassius. You know the circumstances as well as I do. Cassius snapped his mouth shut with a huff, turning his attention back to his food which he starts to pick at. The conversation seems to stop there and I wonder if Amicus is in the clear. While Cassius sure seemed indignant, I get the feeling that Amicus wasn't in any danger in the first place. I guess being the Emperor's son has its perks. Well, could you get me some more of the Azura, Tibor? Look over the table for a moment in confusion. Um, what's that? I try to keep my voice low. That's when Cassius suddenly yowls, clapping a paw to his head. Oh, gods, it doesn't speak the language! I look between Cassius and Amicus in confusion. Of course not. They were abandoned. Most of the abandoned still speak the language. How far away is his home star? Oh, roughly 50,000 light years. I don't care. Don't have it speak again. The last thing I need is a half a headache from the lingua manually translating everything he says. It's barbaric. I don't know if he's calling the headache barbaric or me. Probably me. Upload its language to the Nexus before you let it out in public again, Amicus. I decide I really don't like Cassius. He's talking about me like I'm just a piece of property. Then I feel Amicus is poor on my shoulder for a moment, giving a soft squeeze before pulling back again. The conversation topic then shifts to stuff I don't really understand, mostly politics and the Chemians, whatever that is. Despite their fight earlier, Amicus and Cassius are pretty animated in the conversation. Amicus keeps sticking empty plates in my face, indicating that I should refill them. It's clear that I'm not going to be eating while the wolves are, and I feel my irritation grow. I'm not a servant, I didn't agree to this. If this is supposed to help me blend in, I can't help but feel Amicus could have put me in a better position than this. Virginia sent me a letter last night saying he should be bringing back a Chemian tomorrow, and he got trapped here after the stretch drive depletion. Oh? He wasn't able to return on the retrieval ship. He was on Anchoris at the time, so it took him several months to get back to Adastra. Oh, he's going to be our guest until the next ship arrives. I think it will be quite interesting to see one in person. Who can say that they've met two siblings? Cassius, is reaching. Cassius reaches down and starts stroking Alexios's head fur. The green and grey cat closes his eyes, smiling and purring. I watch this for a moment and freeze up as I feel Amicus's paw on my head. He starts to gently scratch his blunt claws into my scalp, ruffling my hair around. It actually feels really good, but knowing what he's doing gets me pissed off all over again. He already knows I don't want to be doing this, he brought me here against my own will. Now he's stroking me in public like I actually am his pet. Well, I guess it makes sense. I guess he's doing his part to help me blend in just like I'm doing mine. Doesn't mean I don't hate it. Then instead the poor sticks his empty goblet down under my nose. Uh, more wine, please. I let the goblet hang in the air for a moment and take it and reach out robotically for the heavy wine bottle, getting upon my knees to better pour it into the empty goblet. I fill it up as Amicus continues to stroke me. Oh, I bet even few can say they've met an abandoned species, wouldn't you think? Cassius glares at Amicus and I glare at the wine. I try to remind myself this is just to help me get home. Or maybe he actually is just showing me off because he likes how he's getting into Cassius's fur. I turn on my knees to face the wolf and hand back his goblet, noticing how full it is, the wine almost sloshing over the rim. Amicus reaches out for the goblet. My fingers twitch and I feel the goblet slip out of my hand, watching as it seems to fall in slow motion onto its side on the bed. The wine shoots out in a red gush, splashing across Amicus's lighter furred front. The wolf gasps, it tempers suddenly as the wine pours down his chest and stomach and onto his pants. Damn! Meanwhile, Cassius bursts out laughing behind me, snorting obnoxiously. <laughs> uh, maybe there's a reason so few ventured out to meet the Mamicus. I see Alex staring at me. When I meet eyes with him, he looks down. Amicus reaches over me from the towels, glancing down at me as he does. I try to keep myself from smirking, but I think I fail. 
He pauses, staring at me in astonishment as I guess he realises that I did it on purpose. He doesn't look angry though, and instead grabs up the towel and starts patting down his front, the fur still stained a dark maroon colour. What are you doing, Amicus? Cassius has finished his laughing, I look over and see him staring at us. What do you mean, what am I doing? I'm cleaning up the mess. Amicus growls at Cassius, continue to pat himself down. Dear God, you really don't know how to do this. Punish it. Cassius lazily flopped his paw in the air in a slapping motion. I snapped my gaze to Amicus, glaring again. Well, no, well, no I can't do that. Why not? It's in the contract. No physical punishments. Or just like Alexios's. What? You heard me. Alexios is a sibling. It's barely even a child. He is mine and none of your business. Punishment is the only way to teach a lesser species, Amicus. He looks at me. You, a creature, up. I'll hit you instead. Cassius! I jump, so does Cassius, ears ringing as Amicus's deep voice sparrows over me. Meanwhile, Cato just lounges on his bed, listening, or maybe not. I'll make this very clear right now. You are never to lay a paw on him or give him orders of any kind. Cassius, having recovered, raises an eyebrow on Amicus. And if I do, brother? Amicus's fur starts to lay flat on his shoulders again as he shrugs. Well, I'll punch you. Wait, you, you can't do that. We're not pups anymore. And if you call him it again, I'll do the same. Cassius seems to choke for a moment. What in the world has gotten into you, Amicus? He looks at the older wolf. Cato! Yes, Cassius? Well, do something. He can't threaten me like that. Amicus, be nice to your brother. Cassius's ears turn bright red and he slumps on the bed, glaring at his remaining food. Anyway, if you two have finished, then be off to your studies. Don't be late this time, Amicus. Your tutor complained again last week. Well, that's today. You know, you shouldn't care to start paying more attention. After seeing what you accomplished, I'm starting to lean toward trials in making my decision. The room suddenly goes very quiet. And Cassius, I need to speak with you for a moment before you leave. Amicus gets to his feet and I do the same. The wolf glances at Cassius and Cato for their deep in conversation. He turns back to me. Oh, I forgot that it's my study day, so I'll be gone for a little while. I'm going to ask Alexios to show you around and give you something to do while I'm away. I feel myself grow tense at the idea of being without the only person I know around here. Seriously? Listen, you don't have to do anything. I'll make that clear to everyone. But I feel you might have rather have something to do rather than sit in my room all day. He seems to think that it's the chores I'm upset about rather than him leaving me alone. All right. Amicus frowns at me and I can't help but feel a little bad. He does seem to be trying to make things as easy as possible for me. And sorry. I gesture at his still stained front. Oh, don't worry. Yes, yeah, swine isn't easy to get out of the fur. But I know why you did it. I deserved it. Ah, uh, is it he speaking? It's his language again? Shut up, Cassius. What? Alexios. Amicus gestures at the small cat, who is currently slacking the dirty dishes on top of each other. Oh, could you please show Tibor around the palace along with the tasks and activities you do? He's unfamiliar with nearly everything. I would be happy to, Amicus. So you can order my pet around? Cato standing out by the doorway and clearly eager to leave sighs. Enough. Try to be reasonable, Cassius. Now both of you be off to your studies, and a quick shower for you, Amicus. Amicus grumbles and starts to turn away, then turns back to me, resting a paw on my shoulder. I'll be back towards the evening. The big wolf pauses, if wanting to say more, but leaves me with a simple. I'll see you then. And with that, he gives me a little wave and another wink before following Cassius and Cato to the archway. Just as Amicus leaves, Cassius pauses to give me a sour look. Then again, most of his expressions are pretty sour, but it still makes me uncomfortable. Then I'm left alone with a cat. I feel an odd sense of loneliness at seeing Amicus just leave like that. It's like my mother just dropped me off at preschool or something. 
He's the only one that's been treating me like an actual person. Mostly, at least. I hear the small sound of someone clearing their throat behind me. Hello. The small cat smiles at me pleasantly, his paws clasped neatly in front of himself. I say he's small, but he's really about the same height as me. It's just odd seeing another alien that's my size, and I always have to look up at the wolves. Uh, hi. I see Alexios's left eye twitch and he raises a paw to his head. Oh dear. Well, this is going to be an interesting day. Is something wrong? More twitching. Just my lingua. It will take a while to learn your language. But it gets better the more you speak. Though if you don't mind, I'd like to know more about you. I'm very curious. Uh, Amicus told me to act dumb, so I tried to figure out how I might do that. I fix a distant look on my face. Far away. Alexios blinks, then giggles. Oh. We both stand there awkwardly for a moment before he gestures at the table. Well, why don't we have a seat? We eat the leftovers when they're finished. The cat moves over to sit on Kato's bed, reaching out for his own small plate. I'm reminded of how hungry I am, so I'll quickly do the same, choosing to sit on Cassius's bed since Amicus is covered in wine. Will this food agree with your stomach? Well, I think so. It actually looks kind of like some of the stuff I eat back home. I mean, it's basically olives, bread and meat. I point to each of the dishes. Alexios puts his paw back up to his head. Oh my, so many words and in full sentences too. I freeze. Oh, uh, I mean, I don't really know what this food is. I'm just guessing. No, I mean, it's your words. So many of them and in complete complex sentences. Fuck, I'm bad at this. I guess the wolves uplifted intelligence a lot more back then. Oh, maybe. I wonder if I've ruined our plan already, but Alexios doesn't seem alarmed, just curious, so I turn my attention back to the food. There isn't much left on the table. The meat was mostly cleaned off from the bones by Cato. Next were four slices of the bread and the bowl of olives. Alexios starts on the poultry, working at it with his claws until it comes apart into pieces with a loud tearing sound. He hands me one half. You should be able to find a little meat on there. I take it from him, trying not to show my disappointment. Then he puts two slices of bread on a plate and slides it towards me before taking the remaining two. Make sure to use the cheese. The bread is a bit bland without it. I pull a few thin strips of meat off the bone and taste it. Oh, it's good. Really, really good. I quickly search the bones for more, but there isn't much at all. Hungry. I look up and see Alexios delicately picking at his own half a bird. Yeah, haven't eaten in a few days. Oh, really? Why not? The trip here was a bit rough. I guess I did eat on the ship, but it wasn't very filling. Oh, like the protein sludge they have? Yeah, that stuff is quite terrible. I can understand why you're hungry. Well, you won't have to worry. Why not? Oh, we eat dinner with our masters in their rooms. Amicus always serves himself very large portions. He also sneaks me my own food, since Cassius doesn't make, take much himself. Alexius slowly spreads cheese onto his bread. He will take good care of you in that respect. With the mention of Amicus, I start to feel a bit lonely again. Actually, something I've noticed is that the whole palace seems to be lonely. So, where is everyone? Alexios chews thoughtfully on his bread. Hmm? I try to think of a way to phrase things stupidly, then give up as I decide he already knows I'm able to form complex sentences. Well, this palace doesn't seem to have very many people around. Oh, well, do you expect others to be here? Well, I guess like servants or guards or some other officials. Most needs in the palace are covered, covered by artificial intelligence and drones. Same goes to the palace defence. I suppose it may be different where you're from. The siblings learned long ago that if you were sapiens you have in a location that needs to be secure, the better. You and I are an exception. The bread tastes like little chalk, so I decided to spread a little bit of cheese on it, despite the smell. To my surprise, it's salty and creamy and not bad at all. The smell is hard to ignore, though. So, what is the point of having a pet, then? Amicus didn't tell you. Well, he did. He just mentioned status and stuff. Is there any other reason? Why do we have to do stuff with them if they have robots that can do it instead? 
Status is the main reason, yes. Our duty is to be by their side doing public appearances, or in official meetings. Obviously having an artificial sapient doing the same isn't impressive at all. We don't really have to do anything manual in the palace, but Cassius likes the idea of a sapient being his servant. He says it reminds him of the old days. I see. Amicus told me I don't really have to do anything for him, except brush his fur. Ah, yes. Amicus is very meticulous about that. Do you know him well? Very well. I've been here for a few months now, so I've had my fair share of interactions with him, even though Cassius doesn't like it. I see. Uh, what do you think of him? I think you're very lucky to have a master like Amicus. Why's that? Well, Amicus is very kind. Sometimes he tries to be all official and assertive. He likes to tease me, but he comes off as more open, whether he tends to or not. This is all compared to Cassius, of course. I think for a moment. Do you not like being Cassius's pet? There's a pause, though Alexios continues to smile. Cassius is very uh, specific about how he wants to be talked to and such. This is a great quality for a prospective emperor to have, for sure. But in casual conversation, it's much easier to talk to someone like Amicus. I take a sip of the wine, and as far as I can tell, it's similar to the few times I've had it on Earth. He, be he has been really nice to me. At least after the whole kidnapping thing. He is a very nice person. He just tends to uh, not think everything through. Alexios's eyes flick to look behind me before focuses back on my face. I understand that normally we shouldn't speak so candidly about our masters. This is just a conversation between pets. Oh, yeah, I understand. There's a moment of silence that goes on just long enough to be uncomfortable. Yes, I thought you would. I had to say you're extremely perceptive, almost on the same level as a sibling. I wince internally as Alexios points up my intelligence again. It only took me ten minutes to fail my one and only job. Alexios smiles at me again. Ah, was I not supposed to know that? Apparently he's perceptive as well. Uh, don't worry. Like I said, this is between pets. Alexios leans in conspiratorially. I don't just blab everything I know to my master. I'm simply a servant, not spy. He leans back again. Now you might wish I was, but honestly it's really nice to be able to talk to someone other than my superiors. Amicus was the only one to treat me as an equal, but Cassius usually keeps a contact min minimal. I put the last bit of bread into my mouth and as soon as I do Alexios sits up. Calm, we're finished. Yes, Alexios. I watch with fascination as the di dishes levitate off the table and float away through the archway they originally came through. Do you want to go outside? Like I said, there's not much to do. The gardens do require a more sapient touch to keep them presentable. Yeah, sure. I brush crumbs off my jeans and stand up. I'm still hungry, but the amount that I've eaten has taken the edge off it at least. I follow Alexios quietly through the halls, really enjoying the architecture of the palace the first time. We enter the main hall and Alexios stands in the sunlight pouring in through the archways. Ah, aren't the mornings beautiful here? This is the best time to work in the gardens. I say we have a good three hours before it gets too hot. We start walking out in the gardens when I'm suddenly struck by something odd. So, you just said we have three hours? Yes. Well, how long is an hour here? The same. Oh, we use the same minutes and hours and stuff. That didn't seem possible. Alexios thinks rubbing the spot above his left eyebrow. Uh, well, the lingua is a complicated device. It's parental text, so we, it's something we don't really understand at all. But what we do know is it translates language in a way that offers the best understanding possible for the host. Alexios cr crouches by a pillar, examining the ivy ground growing around its surface. I use a measurement of time specific to the wolves and their language, and the lingua simply translated it to a measurement you'd better understand. The small cat chuckles. It's something I've given up on understanding myself. It's not perfect and can create really confusing situations, especially when it comes to certain words and numbers. Oh. I see Alexios single out a small white flower grow growing at the base of the pillar, where he plucks it out and sets it to the side. I start to wonder if I should maybe learn the language. The lingua is impressive and all, but it doesn't seem like it's very specific. Alexios grins. I don't think too much about it. Just try to remember that that doesn't mean everything actually is the same. 
There are 19 hours in a day on Adastra, which I imagine is at least somewhat different compared to your own planet. Anyway, what I'm doing right now is pulling up some weeds. The drones do a good job of watering and pest control, but they often miss smaller weeds like these. I crouch at the pillar next to Alexios, searching through the ivy for weeds to pull at the base. So, there are 19 hours in a day here? Yes. That's a bit shorter than back home. Oh, I get that. There are 30 hours in a day where I'm from. You get used to it after a few weeks, though. I prefer it, actually. I turned my attention back to the pillar and suddenly found myself staring right at a strange crab-like thing sticking to the stone. First I wonder if it's a carving of some kind since it's so big. But as I look closer it moves and I realise it's a massive living spider. The next thing I know I'm rolling away from the pillar action movie style before popping back up to my feet. Oh my god! What is it? A spider... thing. I'm standing a good ten feet away from the pillar now, but I can still see the massive spider, its thick legs fanned out to the width of a clock. I shiver. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. I stare at him. How is that funny? I'm sorry, they are very startling when you first encounter them. Alexios walks up to the spider and starts making shooing motions at it. Even from here I can see its black beady eyes. It doesn't move at all, choosing to sit motionlessly on its pillar. A Dastron arachnids and insects are disturbingly large compared to the ones on my home moon. I look around, suddenly feeling like I'm in danger, imagine giant wasps descending from the skies. Alexios starts to look more frustrated as the spider refuses to be intimidated by his limp wristed swipes. Nothing in the gardens is dangerous though, and they needed to balance the ecosystem. This creature's venom is far too mild to cause much more than an itchy bump, if it bites at all. Alexios gives another weak swipe of the spider, and it takes the opportunity to bolt up his arm so fast that it becomes a blur before stopping on his face. For a moment we both stand there in shock as it clings to him like a face hugger. Then, by Galen, and get it off! He dances around in place for a moment as I simply watch in fascinated horror. Finally he shakes his head hard and the spider runs down his front and scuttles across the ground in some bushes. Alexios heaves her breath for a moment, trembling. Despite myself, I have to laugh in amazement at what I just saw. What? Why are you laughing? Sorry, it was just so surprising, and you showed you were so sure of yourself until I chuckle again. Well, it surprised me. He shivers, rubbing his shoulders. It's honestly nothing to be afraid of when it comes to those. But it's right on me, and the way they move. He shudders again, and you just stood there and watched. I mean, what could I have done if that had happened to me? I'd have jumped in the pond. Alexios sighs and I see his fur start to flatten down again. And he also chuckles. Well, I was about to. Anyway, let's get back to work. You see another spider? Just work around it. For the next hour we move from pillar to pillar, cleaning up the unwanted weeds. I'm way more vigilant now, checking every pillar for spiders before we start. Luckily we don't come across any more. After a while we finally sit on a bench under some trees and Con floats out a few platters of tiny pastries that remind me of quiches. Those are followed by glasses of cold green vegetable tasting drinks. It's delicious. So, can I ask where you're from? Very far away, even further than your home. What brought you here? The cat sighs and pours it with the pastry halfway to his mouth. It's a bit complicated, but I'm sure it's a sort of ambassador. I arrived here just as stretch drive depletion occurred. What was that? Alexios shrugs. Well, for whatever reason, the Romanus stopped supplying the wolves with stretch drive power and the Emperor died. They're starbound right now, so they can't shuttle me back to my planet. We don't know how long the wolves will be without the stretch, so my people sent their own ship to retrieve heaven on Adastra. But I, uh, missed it. Missed it? Alexios frowns, looking embarrassed again. Well, I slept in and missed a departure. Wow, really? I mean, it happens to the best of us, no? Well, I guess. Why didn't they wait for you? That's kind of messed up that they just leave. When using stretch tech, time is important. Everything runs on a specific schedule, so if you miss it, you miss it. And they're certainly not going to send another one out for one person. Wow, didn't you have an alarm clock or someone to wake you? Trust me, it was a series of many unfortunate events that led to that happening. 
The main one being that even though I woke up with enough time to reach a starport, I got lost in Dastra City's terrible public transportation system. I was running from platform to platform, wolves all around me trying to touch me because I'd never seen a cat before, and I could barely read the signs because, well, for my species, water comes from the eyes when we're stressed, so... Oh, you were crying. Do you know what that is? Uh, yeah, my species does it too. He looks away and I can see the insides of his ears turn red. Ah, I did not know that. Anyway, I eventually decided to use my situation to continue my work and build a relationship with the Imperial family. So I became Cassius, his pet. Alexios's situation doesn't sound all that different from mine, even though the reasons for us getting here were very different. When does the next ship come? Alexios shrugs. Years. At least one a decade, but sometimes more. I'm hoping over the next two years, though. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's not the worst life, and the wolves treat me well enough. We do have a special relationship. With Cassius. Between us and the wolves. Unlike the other siblings, our parents originated in the same galaxy. But our views are very different, there's a bond there. Alexios brushes his paws together. Are you done? Uh, yeah. Come, we're finished. And with that, the platters and glasses float away. I'm starting to get used to all of this. But, Kibor, was it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I guess we skipped introductions. You already know me as Alexios, but you can call me Alex. Hello, Alex. Hello, Tibor. So now that we're no longer pretending you're not so sapient anymore, where are you from? Tell me about yourself. That gives me some pause. While he's been really nice to me so far, I know I can't just reveal everything to Alex, so I settle on being vague like he was. Well, I'm from far away, but less far away than you. I'm a primate. I see. Are you important among your people? Uh, no, I'm just a student. Oh. Do you know why Annika chose you, then? I think he just chose me at random. I just happened to be where the uplift occurred. Alexios blinks and laughs. That's just like Amicus. <laughs> yeah, it is actually. But I guess it makes sense to choose a common if he wants to unite the abandoned children again. Oh, yeah? I decide that shifting the conversation away from me is a good tactic for now. Yeah, I didn't explain that to you. Um, maybe a little. He didn't tell me all that much. <laughs> Don't take it personally. Amicus does not often think ahead. Right now, the world's in a bit of a strange situation. Again, this is between you and me. They fall behind the other siblings in terms of spread and resources. The main reason being that they don't uplift their children to similar intelligence levels as themselves. Intelligence levels? I thought they'd just spread their culture. Alex frowns at me. You don't know? I guess you were abandoned, but... You should know that your intelligence, every child's intelligence, was uplifted by a sibling. Oh, no, I guess we lost that bit of information. Well, that's not the end of their problems. These children are indentured servants in a way. In exchange for having their intelligence mostly uplifted, they have to serve the Empire until the debt is repaid. Well, that doesn't sound good. Oh, and how long has that been going on? Yeah, well, let's just say the first successfully uplifted wolf children haven't quite finished repaying their debt. That sounds like slavery. Alex glances at me. It does, doesn't it? That's confusing to me. But if they have all these robots and stuff, why do they need sapiens to be their slaves? Advanced artificial sapiens are gifted by the parents. We can't build them. Or if it's spoiled here in the palace, but outside not so much. And even then, artificial sapiens isn't perfect. And likely never will be. Actual thinking machines don't exist. So why uplifting children to the same intelligence level as a sibling is important. Good ideas can come from anywhere. Well, I guess your people don't do what the wolves do. No, we uplift our children as much as we can. This practice has isolated the wolves. They're seen by the other siblings as harsh on their own children and the rights of sapiens in general. I see. I'm starting to see the wolves and even Amicus in a whole new light. As if reading my mind, Alex goes on. But things are changing. Amicus choosing you as his pet shows he sees you as close to an equal. And then there's Cassius. Alex's tail swishes around on the bench between us. He'd rather stay th things stay the same, or even regress. That's why he's made a strong challenge against Amicus. 
and many wolves were unsure of the change Amicus suggests, and proposed alliance between the wolves and the Chemians is only adding to it. Chemians. And another sibling species, the most powerful in the galaxy, in fact. But what, that worries a lot of people here. There hasn't been a war between siblings in over a hundred years. The last was between the Chemians and the wolves. You can't imagine the, what sort of problems that might create. So Cassius wanting the wolves to stay independent and complete control of their children is rather popular. You might wonder why I'm telling you this, but I want you to understand the empire that you're in. It'll make it easier to uh, navigate. I was in fact wondering why he's telling me all of this. Does he have some of the motive that he's not telling me? Look over at him. Do you want Cassius to become emperor? I like that we can discuss a lot of things, and being a sibling allows me to have more freedom than most. That's one thing that I should probably keep silent on. That only confuses me more, but it doesn't sound like he's on Cassius' side. Maybe Amicus and I could find an ally in him? Well, I think I refer Amicus if his whole thing is to treat other sapiens equally. Well, I can tell that seems to please Alex. Well, we'll find out soon enough after the trials. Alex's mood suddenly brightens. But anyway, I've really been enjoying our time together today. Like I said, it's so nice to be able to talk to someone who isn't my superior. I hope we can do this often while you're here. Yeah, of course. Wonderful. Alex raises the paw to look up at the sun, at Vita. We should keep working, it's starting to get too hot out here. The next several hours we work around the guard before finally moving inside to walk around the palace a bit. He points to doors for things like the throne room and communal bath. But we never go inside, and he tells me I should only do so when I'm with Amicus. Eventually we move back to the dining room where Alexios suggests we watch the screens till our masters return. He says it will better acquaint me with wolvish culture. It takes me a moment to realise I'm watching a sort of film starring wolves similar to Amicus. They're acting out scenarios about travelling into space and finding more sapients. The sapient species they find are wolves in masks. I guess they don't really have sea jags, Everything, every effect looks practical. It's long bore and the acting is overly exaggerated, like they're in a silent film. Hey, don't knock silent films, Tibor. Finally, after what seems like a good three hours, Alex tells me that Amicus will be returning soon and might want to tidy up his room before he gets back. I'm relieved to cut the film short and Alex and I part ways to go to our respective rooms. I'm surprised to see that it's already dark outside. Even with a shorter day, I guess, mindlessly watching wolves overact into other wolves in masks took up more time than I thought. On my way through the marble halls, I pause every now and then to look at the large murals on the walls, depicting everything from wolves swimming to wolves swinging swords to the canines. In the Great Hall is the largest mural, and depicts five wolves. The features are flat and lack any sort of perspective, making the muzzles look a bit askew. Two larger wolves remove the other three. One is white with a feminine shape, while the larger of the two is black and holding his paw to his chest. Around his head is a wreath. Of the three smaller wolves, one is also clearly feminine, while another is white. I wonder if this might be Cassius and Virginia, which would leave the remaining wolf in the middle to be Amicus. He's skinnier, and I wonder if this might be him as a child or teenager. A glowing wreath floats above his head. <clears throat> I jump as someone clears their throat very loudly next to me. I turn around and find myself staring at Cato, the advisor. He looks me up and down for a moment. At least I think he does. More silence. I open my mouth to respond, then remember what Amicus told me. I let my eyes and focus my mouth droop open a bit. Uh, Cato's ears twitch at the sound I make, then clears his throat again. Hello, uh, Tibor, was it? How are you enjoying your first day in the palace? I wonder if I should keep drone or should at least answer the question. I am technically a sapient, so I suppose it's okay if I sort of understand. Uh, good. The left side of Cato's scarred face twitches as he waits for more, but I don't give him anything. Good, good. I trust Alexia showed you around the palace? It's a bit of a stifling life behind these walls, but hopefully with time we'll be able to take you out to the city. I cross my eyes a little. Oh, I like it. Ah, yes. So, uh, where are you from again, exactly? There's something behind this wolf's words, something there that's a little more than instant curiosity. A uh, big rock planet by star. Cato waits, and again I don't say anything more. 
You have a name for the planet. Uh, yeah, big rock planet. Kato massages the left side of his forehead, looking a little bit annoyed. Big rock planet. With water. Kato stares. So, big rock planet with water. I nod dumbly. Kato sighs loudly and stalks off, not even bothering to end the conversation. Wonderful. Now I have a headache. And with that, he disappears around the corner. I decide that I did an okay job, as Kato seems to think that I'm a massive idiot. I make my way quickly to Amicus's room, glad not to not run into anyone else. There isn't much to do. Amicus's room is spotless. So after meandering around and smoothing the bed covers over, I choose to sit down on the sofa and wait. Despite the fact that I've only been up for what's probably been ten hours, I'm exhausted. I won't have any trouble adjusting to the shorter days. As I start to doze, there's a sudden clattering sound toward the door. I jump and see Amicus come in, wheeling a tray with several plates on top of it, heaped high with food. He grins at me and I get a feeling of relief at seeing him. Hello, uh, sorry, I suppose Alex didn't tell you they set these outside the door on the 15th hour. Will he treat you well? Yeah, he was nice. Amicus wheels the cart up the sofa, then flops back onto it next to me, making the whole thing shake. Ugh, that was a long day. Are you okay? Amicus opens one eye at me. Oh, barely. I had to go over maths today and my head feels like it's going to explode. Didn't help the Balbus kept cracking me over the head with his stick when I answered wrong. Wow, well, that sounds harsh. Oh, don't worry, it was nothing compared to the one you gave me. Amicus smirks and I can't help but smile back at his teasing. He seems to have become more comfortable around me with how relaxed he is. Well, I'm sorry about that. Oh, don't be, and stop apologising for it. Now let's wash and eat. My stomach's felt hollow since breakfast. We both go to the restroom to rinse our paws, hands in the sink, or heaping our plates with food. It's more of the same with bread and meat and olives. There's also a good amount of other vegetables and fruit they have a hard time identifying. Amica shows me how to combine the fruit and cheese on the bread. I found myself really starting to like the smelly spread. Well, as long as I ignore the smell. Compared to breakfast, Amicus really wolfs down a lot of food. He probably ends up eating about three times as much as me. All the while he tells me about his scary instruction and how he punishes him way more than Cassius. Well, does he usually get the answers right? Well, yeah, but he should help me understand rather than smack my ears. That doesn't help anything, unless he has the information in his stick and is bashing into my brain somehow. Oh, don't worry, I hate math too. Well, I'm better in other things like literature and history. <laughs> Cassius is hopeless at remembering battles. Amicus flexes the bicep. And he can forget about wrestling. You could never beat me in a fight. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. So yes, he can have all the maths all he wants. The trials don't involve that anyway. What are these trials you guys keep talking about? Amicus takes a big gulp of wine. Gasper when he finally pulls the goblet away from his face. What Cato was considering using to decide the next emperor. Essentially three trials. Music and dance, rhetoric and finally combat. And whoever wins those becomes emperor. Well, whoever wins two out of three. Combat is last. But if one of us wins the first two it won't come to that. I'm really just hoping that Cato chooses me in the next few days now that he's seen you. But if the trials do happen you have nothing to worry about. Amicus grins at me confidently. I don't. Well, I'm better than Cassius in at least two of those things. Perhaps even in music and dance. You know, I'd believe you, but one thing I know about you is how, um, overly confident you are when it comes to certain things. Why do you say that? Our entire experience on the ship, maybe? Well, that's different. I was doing something I didn't really understand. I understand my studies, aside from maths. Amicus leans back finally, when poor on his stomach. Anyway, how's your day? Did Alex show you around? Amicus starts to grab the remaining food set aside on its own plate. Yeah, I've realised there isn't much to do. Ah, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a bad day. I have tomorrow off from studies, though, so we can do something entertaining. Like what? Oh, I don't know, go swimming, go to the baths, talk, oh, you name it. Maybe eventually we can go to the city, too. The city outside? Well, everything's outside. I mean, the one that I can see across the lake. Oh yes, that one. Adastra City, the capital of our empire. 
Oh, isn't it kind of small for that? I mean, it looks really nice, but it kind of just looks like an average sized city. Amicus frowns. Oh, I think it's quite large. How big are cities on Earth? I shrug. I don't know, pretty big, millions of people? Amicus raises an eyebrow. Millions? Uh, yeah. I wonder if the lingua is translating everything correctly. Why? How big is Adastra? The city? Oh, just over 5 million. The world population is 80 million. Oh. How many humans are there? Like, 7 billion? Amicus chokes. What? Is that a lot? Well, that's preposterous. Do you know how population control measures put in place? Well, not in most places. Amicus shakes his head. Well, you are parentless, so I guess it makes sense your species might be so... misguided? Amicus seems to try very hard to choose the last word, even though he's still been very condescending. He seems to notice my noise, though. Well, is your species doing well? Is your planet able to, to sustain such a population? Sort of. I guess there are problems. Amicus strokes his chin. Well, I suppose when I become emperor, I could ask the parent about your species. The whole thing is a real mystery, but it's clear that we must have overlooked your people somehow. He smiles at me. Maybe we could even bring you into our fold again. Whoa, hang on a second. Images of Roman spaceships descending from the heavens to enslave the human race, all because of me, flash in my mind. You know, Alex told me about what you do here as sapiens. Doesn't sound like something humans would want to be part of. What did he tell you? The whole enslavement thing. Enslavement? What you do to your children? Well, that's a harsh word for it. No, it's the right word. Humans have done the whole indentured servant thing back on Earth, and it never turned out well for the servant. And because his ears go down a bit. And as misguided as humans might be, we've at least abolished slavery. I notice Amicus his ears turning red. Maybe never expected to be lectured on ethics by human. Oh, well, I... Well, I don't mean to change things a bit when I become emperor. A bit. Well, I mean, things just can't be changed all at once. It has to be gradual. Hmm. Amicus fixes his tail in annoyance at me. Listen, I agree with you. We've been trying to change the way we've treated our children for generations. My grandfather and my father will both work towards this. Well, while that's messed up and definitely wrong, I think the intelligence thing might be even worse. What intelligence thing? The grim Islamic as his face tells me he might already know the answer. The way you stunted intelligence in the children you uplifted. Amicus is silent for a moment. I can tell all of this is making him very uncomfortable. I have to ask myself again how I got to this point, sitting on the sofa debating ethics with the prospective Emperor Wolf. He finally folds his arms and huffs. Again, I agree with you on all of this. I don't like the way we be treated our children. In the end, I truly feel that becoming a more compassionate and united empire will lead to a better outcome for everyone. It's going to take small steps, but understand that it's something I mean to fix. And stop saying you like I did it. I was born into this. I've come to realise how much of an open book Amicus is as a person, so I don't doubt his words. Well, as long as Cassius doesn't become emperor. Amicus snorts. <laughs> Not a chance. Well, if he does, it sounds like he's going to reverse all of that. Well, I'm saying there's no chance of it. Wait, how much has Alex been telling you? It was a short conversation. I asked him about the Empire. I didn't, but I don't want to get Alex in trouble in case he wasn't supposed to tell me. Cassius seems like a terrible person, by the way. I'm not just talking about his personality. He wants to keep people enslaved. It's complicated. He's just very traditional. But again, there's no chance. I sigh the wolf's overconfidence, but he does know his brother far better than I do. Well, at least I'm glad that I'm behind the right wolf in getting myself home. The right wolf? Yeah, I can't imagine being under your brother. Amicus glances at the plate he'd been building with food. Speaking of, I'm going to bring this to Alex in the garden. Did you want to accompany me? I run a hand through my hair, feeling the griminess from two days of no shower. Actually, can I use the shower while you're gone? I feel kind of gross. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, just step in and it starts up. There's a screen on the wall that controls temperature. It has a colour spectrum that you can drag your finger across. I'll figure it out. Ah, right. Well, I should be back by the time you're finished. 
and with that Amicus balances his plate of food in his paws and he, as he strides out of the room leaving me to go into the bathroom. I quickly use the toilet again, certainly glad that I don't have to use that public toilet like the ones I've seen drawings of in my Roman history books. The shower is easy enough to understand and the water is immediately warm and pleasant, so I don't have to bother with the temperature. There are several glass bottles of soap, so I choose the one that smells the best and give myself a quick wash. When I'm done, I grab a towel off the wall and dry off before wrapping it around my waist. I think about putting my clothes back on. The idea of stepping back into that underwear has me hesitating. Instead, I open the door and am greeted to the sight of Amica sitting on the edge of the bed, looking off to the side, a paw in his lap holding a brush. His head snaps in my direction for he immediately averts his eyes. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to see. I thought you'd be dressed. Hey, it's fine. I've got the towel on. Slowly, Amicus turns his gaze back to me, eyes drifting down my torso for immediately snapping back up again. Oh, uh, I thought you hated any sort of nudity. Oh, not really, just the genitals. Even then, I don't hate it. It's just, well, private. Ah. Amicus seems to be staring at me. I start to feel a little self-conscious. Is everything okay? Amicus looks away again. Oh, sorry, I, I'm just not used to seeing you like that. I've only seen humans with clothing, so I just sort of imagined you to always be that way. Well, my clothes are dirty, so I was going to ask you about maybe getting some clean ones. At least until you can get me that tailor. Oh, of course. Uh, Com, send us some robes from storage. Uh, children's robes, please. Yes, Amicus. Uh, thanks. Well, of course. I stand there awkwardly for another few seconds till Amicus seems to snap back to reality again. He holds up the brush. Well, anyway, I thought maybe you'd like to be groomed too. I feel it's only fair after what you did for me. Oh, well, it's only on my head. All easier for me, then. Amicus grins. Well, all right. I walk over to the bed and sit with my back to the wolf. Amicus adjusts his seating to face me more directly, then starts to run the brush, brush gently through my hair. We sit in silence for a bit and I start to enjoy the feeling of the brushing, especially the way the firm bristles run across my scalp, giving me shivers up and down my neck. Sorry for talking so much earlier. I, I'm not used to being able to talk to someone. The palace is a bit lonely, so having a friendly conversation with someone other than Karma is a bit of a novelty. Amicus chuckles. Well, that was probably why I was having so much trouble focusing on my studies today. I was so excited to come back home and speak with you. Hearing that makes me feel a little bad for the wolf. I suppose being the prospective emperor doesn't allow you to have many friends, and being in such an empty palace is definitely lonely. I guess this is why Alex told me basically the same thing. Well, you're fine. I didn't mean to be too harsh earlier. I know it's not your fault. No, I think we're on the same page on that one. All the more reason to unite against Cassius, eh? Oh! As if he'd forgotten something, Amicus's other paw comes around my side and on his palm I see two purple grapes. Well, I managed to snatch a few of those off Alexios's earring. He wasn't too happy about that. <laughs> Want one? Seriously? I take one, more out of being nice to Amicus than anything. But when I bite into it, I can't help but notice how juicy and sweet it is. Amicus talks me with the grape in his mouth. Hmm, I don't know why, but his grapey earring always tastes the best. Oh, by the way, if you don't mind, I invited Alex to our outing tomorrow. Cassius is going to be away to do some speeches and is leaving Alex behind for once. Oh, of course not, we got along really well. I lean my head back, allowing the wolves to continue the brushing. Well, your fur, hair you call it? Well, it's not like a wolf's fur, but it's rather nice. I smile. Well, thank you, Amicus. Well, if you'd like, I can do this here every day. I feel that's fair. I have to admit that I really like this, so I accept. Yeah, sure. It feels really nice. I hear some thumping sounds, and I imagine it's Amicus's tail wagging against the bed. So, washing you, brushing you, and making you smell nice for all my duties? Well, that and accompanying me to important meetings and public outings. For all you do during those is stand there and look civilised. Yeah, that's what you all keep telling me. This seems pretty easy. Oh, there is one thing you can do for me before I go to bed. What? Well, uh, uh, full body massage. I look over my shoulder at him. Oh, we can just stick for the other duties. I laugh and I'm because his ears come back up. He continues to brush for a while long before finally setting it aside. Uh, looks much better now. 
I gently run a hand over my hair, not a greed that feels softer than it's ever felt before. Well anyway, Tibor, I am looking forward to these months ahead with you, even though we started off a bit poorly. I look back at the wolf, his earnest but tentative smile. He's definitely a man of contradictions, rash half the time, but considerate most of the time. I'm not sure what to make of him, but at this point I feel I can at least trust him, and that's saying a lot out of what he put me through. I smile back. Yeah, me too. There we go. That was part two of Adastra. And I hope you enjoyed that. I'm really enjoying this. Like I've said before, it's a great visual novel. I can't wait to see what happens next. And we mustn't forget the credits here. I mean, Haps has some great uh, sprites going on. Black Sun's got the art. And you really have to give Howley some uh, congratulations for his writing here. Uh, it's really set me into the story right from the start. And just getting to know more of uh, the wolves and what's going on. Yeah. Definitely Team Amicus here. <laughs> anyway, since I know none of you are listening now, I'll still say it. Thanks for watching and... Uh, I'll be back with more Echo, more After Class, more Night in the Woods, and definitely more Adastra when uh, everything comes out. So until then, bye now. <laughs>